I'm pleased to introduce, last but not least, um, Jane Wang, who is a research scientist at DeepMind. Uh, her background is in computational and cognitive neuroscience, complex systems and physics, and looking forward to your talk. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for setting up this uh, incredible symposium on meta-learning. I've learned a lot so far, and I've really enjoyed myself today. Uh, and thank you to uh, all of you for staying to the last talk. Um, today I'll be talking about meta-reinforcement learning, and in particular, thinking about learning uh, across multiple scales um, of reward-based learning. And this is work done with my colleagues at DeepMind. Here are two examples of games that a human might play. One is a driving game, the other is, I think, Mario. Uh, they're very different, but a human, after just a few minutes, would probably do uh, fairly well, um, just from, from playing around. On these same games, machine learning models like DQN require millions or sometimes even billions of frames to train up that a, to the same level that a human would, would get to in minutes. So taking this beyond just games, here's an example of a question you might get on an IQ test uh, called a Raven's Progressive Matrix. So you had to infer the missing pattern here um, based on the sequence of other patterns. In this case, uh, it's not enough to have simply memorized a mapping between the input and the correct answer, as you have most likely have not seen this exact sequence of patterns before. But you have definitely performed analogical reasoning in your lifetime before, and you have the ability to notice and infer patterns. You therefore have a prior about how to, how to perform this task um, that you learned through previous experience. This is the general principle of meta-learning, learning that learns faster with more tasks, benefiting from transfer on related tasks uh, and across different tasks. So essentially, we're learning an inductive bias or a prior. These ideas have been around for a while. They were discussed uh, by Schmidt Huber, Thrang and Pratt over two decades ago, um, and also earlier today uh, by many people. Um, but the earliest experimental study of learning to learn actually dates all the way back to 1949. Um, in this experiment, Harry Harlow presented monkeys with two novel objects, one of which was rewarded upon selection with food underneath and the other was not. For a set number of trials constituting an episode, I think this was six, uh, the monkey was presented with the same objects with randomized left-right placement. Two new objects are introduced for every training episode. Over the course of training with many object pairs, the, monkey, uh, the monkeys gradually learn to identify the rewarded objects um, just from observing the outcome of the first trial. So that by the end of training, indicated by this red line here after many episodes, it's selecting randomly on trial one, but then it uses the reward outcome in order to perform perfectly at trial two and thereafter. So in effect, it's, it's um, able to do one-shot learning and it's learned an abstract inductive bias with roles for rewarded and unrewarded objects. Uh, and these roles can be immediately filled with new, um, new objects. So this ability to learn more quickly from reward feedback um, with more, up and more and more episodes is what I'll refer to as meta-reinforcement learning. Broadly speaking, we can conceptualize different nested timescales of re reinforcement learning that are happening all in parallel, with the shortest timescale corresponding to learning within a single episode, such as which specific object is rewarding. At the next level, we have learning across episodes, so learning task structure, um, we which we can also think of as priors. Learning at one scale makes uh, learning at the lower scales easier in this case. Um, and of course, it's possible to take this even further to think about how we can learn these priors themselves. Uh, like, or sorry, how we can learn to learn the priors, um, such as having the notion of physical consistency, objects, object permanence, and physics. And this is the kind of learning that's done over the course of a lifetime or even multiple lifetimes, such as with evolution uh, of the sort that we've been talking about um, earlier today uh, um, in, in earlier set sections. Um, but in this talk, we're just going to focus on the first two levels, and in particular, how we're going to be uh, learning structured priors. Now, there are many ways to build a prior into your system. Uh, you can, of course, handcraft them. Um, and there's been a bunch of recent work uh, that's been done recently um, and has been talked about uh, and reviewed wonderfully by Peter Abiel and others, such as learning good initializations, learning a meta-optimizer, and so forth. Um, but today, I'm going to be, uh, the work I'll be focused uh, on is most closely related to work done by Adam Santoro and colleagues um, in which they implicitly learned uh, the prior with, um, uh, with the recurrent neural network and uh, an external memory system. Um, and they did this in the supervised learning setting. But what all these approaches have in common is a way to build in assumptions that constrain the space of hypotheses to search over, which is what allows learning at the next scale to be faster. 
But we're interested in reinforcement learning, and the kinds of priors we want to learn involve how we map the past history of observations and rewards to future actions. Um, this is why we need a recurrent neural network. Concretely, we want to learn the priors by training the weights of, re, uh, of an RNN, which have, has access to previous observations and um, reward, maintain a hidden state, and it integrates sequential information over time. And this allows it to implement task-specific RL in the recurrent activations. At the same time, we constrain the hypothesis space by training on a distribution of tasks that are correlated in some way. And uh, this correlation is, is in the prior that we want our, uh, our weights to learn but it has to be different in the ways that we want to abstract over. So how is this different from normal reinforcement learning? Well, everyone's already seen this figure a million times by now, so I'm not going to really belabor it. Uh, it's essentially just illustrating RL as an algorithm that tries to learn the best policy uh, given observations from, from an environment, and we want to maximize reward. The learning algorithm is typically Q-learning or policy gradient or some variant. And the policy that you're adjusting is some kind of a deep neural network if we're doing functional approximation. Over the course of training, the weights, uh, these weights are then adjusted to create the best policy. If we want to learn on a sequential task, we need an RNN. Uh, but if we want our, our algorithm to uh, meta reinforcement learn, we need two uh, additional ingredients here. So as mentioned before, we need a distribution of tasks that all share task structure. We can't just learn on one task. Um, and second, we want to augment the observation with the past history of rewards and actions. In this way, the recurrent neural network is able to map the history of uh, past observations and actions and rewards to future actions in order to pick, the, to pick up on the task structure that exists in our distribution of tasks. So this mapping is done via the hidden states um, the, the activations of the RNN, which I'll also refer to as, as activity dynamics. Um, since they can dynamically change from time step to time step based on reward feedback, we essentially have the emergence of a secondary RL algorithm uh, that is existing just in the, um, in the activations. So what this means is that if we, uh, if we completely freeze the weights, if we take away the RL algorithm that's adjusting the weights, we still have the existence of a fully functioning RL algorithm learning from reward feedback completely in the dynamics, and we call this meta-RL because one RL algorithm is used to train another that we can then implement during test. Um, and as Peter mentioned earlier, this work was released almost at, uh, at about the same time with um, OpenAI. So going back to the classical Harlow task I was talking about before, we trained our meta-RL agent on an analog of this task using pix pixel-based inputs. So each episode, two image images are sampled. One is rewarded, uh, the other is not. Um, and we see that even with the network's weights held fixed, the network learned to implement the same one-shot learning procedure as the monkey, so learning from, the, from just a single, the first trial. And remember, these are completely novel images, so this is a pretty hard task to do, just, to, um, just in, the in the activations. Um, this behavior is emerging over training in a similar way, where with more episodes, you start to see the emergence of this one-shot learning behavior. So to summarize the ingredients, we assume a generative model of our task environment parameterized by a set of parameters phi, and on, on each episode i, we sample a set of parameters phi i to train on. Um, notice the episodic nature of this setup, which is important because the goal is to do, do well over episodes and not over single trials. Also note that this is not the same as a multitask environment. We are assuming a distribution of tasks with structure. Uh, I want to make the point that uh, if we have a space of arbitrarily structured tasks, um, these can actually conflict and make learning useful prior um, base, uh, or useful inductive biases basically impossible. So it is important that we have this um, structured distribution. So I'm going to use this schematic here to refer to the meta RL model. It's simplified, but it contains the key components that I'll be making reference to. Um, these are the primary RL algorithm that's adjusting the weights. We use advantage actor, advantage actor critic, and we turn, off the, uh, turn this off during test. We have these auxiliary inputs. Uh, I mentioned the um, reward, last reward in action. And then, of course, we have a recurrence, which we just use an LSTM. Um, and we're integrating the history. Uh, and so, again, the combination of all of these properties allows for the emergence of a secondary RL uh, algorithm that's implemented in the activations. Um, and the secondary algorithm has potentially radically different properties depending on the task requirements. So we first start with a classical reinforcement learning task, the multi iron bandit. Um, it has the benefit of being very simple while requiring a non-trivial policy of, of balancing exploration with exploitation. On each trial, you're asked to select from n slot machine arms, each of which is paying out with a certain probability. We're just sampling that from a Bernoulli uh, uniform distribution. 
we hold these probabilities constant for an episode, which is just 100 arm pulls. And during tests, we hold all the network weights constant. Um, and this graph here is visualizing 300 uh, of the episodes during tests, uh, trial numbers on the x-axis, and each dark tick mark mar uh, marks a suboptimal arm pull. So you can see that initially the agent is uh, exploring, and then it eventually settles on the correct arm. So now we're plotting performance in terms of cumulative regrets. So lower is better since it measures the gap between the actual reward and what the reward of the, uh, the best arm would have given in expectation. Um, averaging over the 300 test episodes, um, we see that um, we're doing essentially about the, uh, on par with uh, standard existing algorithms um, that were made specifically for this independent bandit task. Um, so uh, Gittin's indices, UCB, and Thompson sampling, um, these, are, these all achieve sublinear regret. These are known to be state-of-the-art with respect to this bandit task. Um, but nevertheless, we achieve basically the same uh, kind of performance, even though it, this is a, a general purpose meta-learning algorithm. So we can ask now which aspects of the system I described are crucial to, um, to this task by conducting ablation experiments, where we take away each component and we see the effects on performance. So I'm just going to readjust the axes here. Uh, we can see that the ablation experiments show that losing access to any one of last reward, last action, and recurrence drastically reduces performance, so that now the model's performing with linear regret without um, any one of these. So meaning that there are a lot of episodes in which it never, never settles on the right arm. So all of these seem to be important. Let's move now beyond simple independent bandits, because one of the benefits of being able to learn a prior over the distribution of environments is that the prior learned will exactly match the complexity of the structure that exists in the training tasks. So in this graph, the green curve here is the model trained on the independent bandits as before. The blue curve indicates the performance when we train on bandits in which the two arms are exactly negatively correlated. Um, and you can see that MetaRL performs more optimally on a test distribution that is um, matched to the distribution that it was trained on. So why does this happen? If this were neuroscience, we would have to implant some electrodes and record neuroactivity while rats are running around a maze, and it would be a big nightmare. Um, but it's not. Uh, this is a simulated network, so we have access to all of the unit activations, and we can relate them to the task parameters. As an, uh, so we can now ask how the network is solving the independent and the correlated bandits differently. The two tasks have different structure in that the independent bandits has uh, two degrees of freedom, and the correlated bandits only have one. After we trained uh, two separate networks on these two different um, task distributions, we can now hold the weights fixed and examine how the hidden states look at the end of the episode for different arm reward probabilities. So again, we're looking at test performance. So we, we're holding um, the weights constant, and we're, we're testing on just the correlated bandits to see how the activity dynamics are, differed, uh, are different based on how we train. We perform a dimensionality reduction on the activity of the uh, recurrent active activations, and we plot the first two principal components and color code according to the arm reward probabilities. Um, so as you can see down here on the lower right, for the model trained on correlated bandits, the system has found a very simple 1D manifold. Um, but the model trained on independent bandits has found a different, more complex manifold to represent the task. Um, this complex manifold is not optimized for correlated bandits, uh, which explains the worst performance. We train MetaRL on a variety of other tasks, but I don't have time to get into these today. Um, the outcome of these experiments shows that the RL algorithm uh, implemented in the recurrent activations of the LSTM is capable of conforming to a wide variety of task structure, including making choices to gain information, um, which uh, even if it's not immediately rewarding, and displaying different effective learning rates based on the volatility of the, um, of the environment, even when the actual learning rate is held um, to zero. So one drawback with using RNNs to learn um, inductive biases and task structure is that you can't learn anything that extends beyond the length of your unroll. And the hidden state is reset uh, at the beginning of every episode. So you have effectively this time horizon in which you lose inf information. Um, in addition, learning priors is useful when the tasks that we encounter are randomly drawn from some distribution. But in real life, we often encounter the same situations uh, over and over again. And it'd be really useful to have access to these past experiences. So for example, we often um, go to the same restaurants uh, again and again in our city. And when we go back to the same restaurant uh, and we're trying to decide what to order, we usually use our specific memories of um, maybe the last time we were there and how we felt about the meal that we ordered. So how can we extend MetRL to handle situations like this? 
We can think of each restaurant as being a different bandit task with different arm reward probabilities. But now each task is, uh, is tagged with an observable context, um, say the name of the restaurant, and we know, uh, so we know if we're re-encountering the same task. So we call this the contextual bandit. And what we want is a way to reload critical task-relevant information from the path. Uh, the simplest way is to just use a lookup, lookup table like a dictionary. Uh, and, and when we do that, the context now naturally serves as the key, because it's, uh, it's our tag. And I showed earlier that by the end of the episode, the hidden state of the LSTM contains critical task-related information, like estimated reward probabilities and policy. So we can then store this uh, hidden state as the value um, in, this uh, in this dictionary. And if we do this a few more times, um, we see, uh, after seeing some more context, um, so we're querying the dictionary at the beginning of each episode using k-nearest neighbor lookup. When we see a completely new context, as, um, as happened in the last couple of, uh, of episodes, there's no match. This means that learning proceeds just the same way as with normal meta-RL. But now, if we see context one again, um, when we query our dictionary, we get a match. In this case, we simply initialize the hidden state of the LSTM to the values that we retrieved. This is, in a sense, allowing the network to continue where it left off the last time it was in this context. So how does this look in practice? Uh, as a first proof of concept, we use contexts that are just perfect keys, so um, just barcodes, meaning that there's no uncertainty about whether or not you've seen this particular context before. Um, we eventually extend it to, um, to, to loosen this constraint. Um, we tested on a very simple distribution of tasks in which there are only two arms, uh, so the arm probabilities are always either 0.1 or 0.9. And now if we look at cumulative regret, we see that upon the first exposure to a context, we perform the exact same as in normal meta-RL, meaning we need to still explore a little bit, we uh, achieve non-zero regret. But upon repeated exposure, when we come back to the same context, the regret is now zero, because agents are able to uh, simply reload the, the task critical information from the last time, and it completely eliminates the need to explore. So this is, in effect, arbitrarily elongated the time horizon over which we can learn, uh, and is complementary to the priors that we learned about general task structure. So to recap, I've explained the various components that are required for meta-RL to occur, and uh, such as um, re recurrent dynamics that integrate to past reward um, history uh, and observations and past action. Um, primary, uh, we have a primary error-based RL algorithm that uses a reward prediction error to adjust the weights. Uh, we need a distribution of interrelated tasks. Um, and the results and effects are that we have a, uh, the ability to absorb the structure of uh, our distribution of tasks as priors. And this leads to faster learning with more tasks and more training. Um, our learned RL algorithm is implemented in the recurrent activations, not in the weights, uh, and therefore it has the potential to be drastically different from the base RL algorithm and is matched to the task structure. So I've shown only a subset of the types of tasks that can be learned with meta-RL. I hope I've convinced you that a recurrent network has high expressivity in the types of RL tasks that it can learn to perform in its activations. I've shown you one possible extension of meta-RL that allows us to elongate the time horizon over which we can learn task structure. With more sophisticated architecture, we can continue to expand the scope of what we can train on to perhaps look at things like continual learning or lifelong learning. And with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors co and colleagues at DeepMind, and I'm, I'll take questions. Great presentation. Just a quick question. So, uh, what's the kind of performance we have when it's a correlated bandit problem? And also, what happens when, so for example, you, there are way more bandits than you could potentially explore? So, think of going to a restaurant. At the end of the day, you probably only have t tried like 50% of the dishes or something like that. Let's say the cost of trying something completely new is, is very expensive, but then if there's beef dish A is good, you're kind of uh, hypothesizing on beef, well, beef dish B is also good, and you might at some point try to explore it. Um, oh. 
Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I don't quite understand the question. So, so if there's correlation between the bandits and yeah. then you can't afford to train to like test everything, yeah. then what's the kind of performance or intuition uh, in, the, yeah. in that scenario? Um, well, I guess I, I'm seeing two parts to your question. So one, you're asking about if there's correlation in the uh, arm reward probabilities, and then the other is if there's way too many uh, arms for you to reasonably explore. Is yeah. that what you're... Yeah, right. Um, well, well, basically, uh, so the reason that MetaRL can be quite powerful is because it can leverage um, these structures that exist in your task. So if you do have correlations that allow you to um, reduce the amount that you need to explore. So if, if say, by exploring a small part of, the, of uh, your arms, uh, a few of your arms, then you don't really need to explore other arms because of these dependencies, then it would learn to pick up on this, and it would learn to do better than an algorithm that's just learning, uh, assuming independence in the arms. Okay. But, yeah, so, and what happens if there's just way too many to explore? So if there's, um, if there's way too many, then, uh, I mean, I think something like the... Um, the, the architecture that we have with the, with the dictionary and we can reload the memory from the last time um, is quite useful because you, um, in that case, you don't need to sort of uh, re-explore every single time. You can just think to something that maybe was good enough uh, the last time that you had tried. Um, okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you.